All right. So this is the start of this whole thing. Um, today, on stream, I'll be doing my yearly overhaul. Um, this is something I've been doing for a little less than 15 years on uh, two instruments of my own, and I've done another couple students' instruments and showed it around a little bit. Um, so while I'm not an expert repair tech or anything like that, uh, the methods I'm using are pretty easy and straightforward. They're pretty manageable for people to do with uh, minimal amount of equipment and uh, this 70 something year old instrument has gotten 10 years of this treatment and has not been damaged in any way I've seen by it um, so I think they're relatively safe ones I'm not about to say that I have the best solution for everything or that all of the ways that I'm going to be doing it are ideal um, but that's that's the way it goes I think any person even the most experienced tech that they that says that they know everything the best about how to do everything actually is probably something you should question at least a little bit for your own service anyway um because i've got this uh as a recording which is new for me uh i figured i'd play just just a chromatic scale on a okay read um to get kind of an apples to apples comparison of what this will sound like when it's hopefully back together um see if there's any like because I the bore is gets oiled uh, normally every year, but it's been about a year and a half this time, um, and there is a slight chance that will change the tone of things. Also, if I put something back on funny, <laughs> there there will be notes that don't come out when you go to play your chromatic scale. Um, other than that, most of most of the point of this stream is kind of cleaning up this noise, because especially like you can see them, especially these pinky keys tend to be very loud on this instrument, even though I've got no rollers. Uh, but I'll, you know, play through, turn up the volume a little so it's easier to hear me. It's a little bit that I'm going to say. I don't, I'll talk some, but I'm not expecting to, like, read a book or anything. <laughs> It actually feels way different in the room with the table here blocking some of the sound from the bottom. You can kind of hear in that middle range that it's very, very clacky. And those are, those are notes that tend to be a little resistant, a little hard to get clean articulations on. Maybe just doing that will help a little. It's also kind of a check of the reed, which is going to be different by the time I reassemble this, so that's, it's not totally apples to apples, but I'm not sure that's achievable. Yeah, alright, that's plenty of play. It works. It has been a functional instrument. Now, we take it apart. Give the, should keep that on. Should be a little bit louder for the hoist side of it now. <coughs> Hopefully not too loud. But we'll get this thing disassembled. And uh, I guess before I go any farther, um, I've got an outline of basically the procedure I'm going to follow on my website. It's the, the link that's up that direction. That's where the arrow is. Um, and it's... It's basically what I'm doing here, slightly different order, but I mentioned the tools, I mentioned the policies, the pictures are of the same instrument the last time I did it. Hi, <laughs> welcome back, a little different stream today, but could be interesting, could be useful hopefully for someone. Get a little of this water out. I didn't actually play much today, so I don't think I have to fully swab. Plus I've been, I'll be cleaning stuff out. Got all the little pieces here. Um, is there a better? Is the other camera better for this? I don't think so. Uh, maybe. It's much less red. Man, the exposure is all weird on this other camera. Uh, I'm just gonna screw with it again. Again, apologies. So let's give it a little more red. 
Oh, just a little. And then... Is... Where is it? Is it in color? It's not in the color. Exposure... Is it in the video amp? Uh, sort of. I'm just gonna mess with the exposure control. Boost that up some more. Maybe that'll be good. Looks more normal. A little closer to reality. Still a little less red than the instrument is in person. Anyway, um, basic idea is you just take um, this way, this way, that way. Okay. You just take all the, the keys off. I'll start with this one because it's only got one. Easy to do. You clean out all the space. There's some gunk that builds up. It's probably very hard to see, but there's like a little, little like schmutz there. Um, that'll be good to clean off. Then you can see how dark all the keys are here. Th this is all silver plated, so uh, they should be this bright or brighter everywhere. So there's a lot of tarnish on this instrument that has been pretty consistent year over year for me. Um, you can see, I don't know how well you can see, but down in the tone holes, I can actually see a slight little like ring again of schmutz in there. Um, clean that out with a brush, get everything off, fix some of that rattling that happens quite a bit and just you know go over the whole thing with a fine tooth comb when stuff is off you can see if pads need to be replaced you can see if stuff is hardening you can see if like felt or um, cork is peeling any of that kind of stuff all that'll be something to look at and then I think at the end though I have less experience doing this um, you can see there right on the bottom of this the cork is kind of peeling away as it is now yeah, you can kind of see it. Um, and this has been <laughs> like this for a couple of months. I've been very lazy about fixing it. Uh, so I think this is a good opportunity to go by and fix it. And I don't, well, normally if you have, like if your joints aren't fitting well together, you can, as, you, as I have here, this is cork with um, wax dental floss, unflavored wax dental floss wound over top of it to make it just a little bit thicker. Um, that would normally be like a part of kind of redoing this, but I've actually got a humidifier on the way, um, probably arriving next week. So I think I'm going to hold off doing any like significant like fitting stuff on that end until sometime after these streams. Um, but time to get started. Maybe I'll, I'll run over the basic tools that I'll be using. Most of it is you know, around the house kind of items. A few things are kind of specialized, but there's really not a lot of them. The, you run into more specialized requirements when you're actually having to like replace pads or replace corks or that kind of thing. Which I have a few of, I'll see, I'll see what I need. This, I need this, and this. Okay. So this is, oh, well, it's frozen. <sighs> Hopefully that doesn't happen frequently. Activate. There we go. Now there's a bunch of equipment on the table. So, ba absolute basics. Maybe I should switch to the other one for this. That's still not great. <laughs> Absolute basics. Um, you got a couple of cloths. I probably won't be using these microfiber cloths much, um, but some paper towels. They're easy. They're convenient. Uh, a soft cloth. Uh, this is uh, like cotton, not a uh, synthetic fiber. And it's usually better. I, I would say that it's not ideal to use this on everything. It's just for the amount of grease that's going to come off of things, it's much more convenient to, to throw these away than to clean up a whole bunch of these cloths. Um, so that's something there. One specialized cloth involved, and this is a packet of several actually, um, but silver polishing cloths. Um, when you're cleaning tarnish off of silver, you need some kind of chemical agent to get rid of the oxidation, um, and that's fine and normal. Uh, if you're doing it on an instrument, you never want to use a liquid silver polish of, of any kind, because the risk that it gets onto the finish of the instrument, or the wood of the instrument, or the pads of the instrument, and then does severe damage to them is pretty high. So they make these claws, which are 
just regular pieces of cloth, except they've been kind of pre-coated in silver polishing chemicals. I, it's, I don't know what they use. I don't remember what they use, but they look basically like normal cloths. And then they've got an internal side that has the silver stuff on it. So this is regular cloth on the outside and then silver polishing cloth on the inside. It makes a big difference. Tarnish comes off very quickly using these. Um, and I will probably go through this entire cloth worth in cleaning the tarnish off of this. Um, this is probably an atypical amount of tarnish. Like I find my instrument tends to get more than others that I've seen. Um, but it's what I need, so it's what I'm gonna use. Uh, for other tools, aside from the, the claws, I've got two sizes of screwdriver. This is probably the most important thing. I'm using a 2.5 millimeter and a 1.5 millimeter, both pretty good quality ones, but you don't need super great quality ones. Um, I've got a couple of paint brushes. These are with natural fibers. These are really good for like cleaning in crevices and things, um, and they're pretty easy to clean up after otherwise. If you use synthetic fibers, the stiffer bristles can scratch up the surface of things, so I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I've got a couple, I've got like a little bottle brush. This was actually, I think, sold to me for instrument related stuff. And then I've got my vocal brush, which is my normal kind of snaked bottle brush thing, whatever they call these. Um, these are good for cleaning up the tone holes. And you're going to need to do that a decent amount, so useful. I've also got just a handful of Q-tips for kind of the same thing. You, you got to poke it and clean stuff at some point. Uh, this is probably one of the more unusual ones and not a kind of grease that a lot of techs will use. Some people will use oil to uh, silence their keys. Some people will use uh, different kinds of grease. I've got one here that's like a, like a waxy kind of grease that works fine. But this was recommended to me uh, when I first started doing this and this is molybdenum heavy duty CV joint grease. Uh, sold at most auto stores. I think they got this online. Um, but you get a tub that is gigantic and if you can see the little spots in there, that's how much of it I've used in the like four years I've had it on my instrument. Like you use a tiny amount, this will last me more than the rest of my life. Um, but it's it's been great. Like it, it holds on better than oil. Like it, the grease generally will stick to the the key bearings better than oil. Um, it doesn't. It hasn't hurt the finish of any of the instruments that I've used it on. Um, it's inexpensive. This thing was like five or six bucks. Um, and I've actually used it on like my profile and uh, profiler and other things. It's a, it's a pretty good multi-purpose, you know, grease for like hand tools and, and basic machinery kind of things. Um, beyond that, I've got a little bit of cork grease, which will be used occasionally, but it'll be mostly the vocal and then just making sure the gasket is fine on the bottom of the boot. And then I've got some contact cement, which is old and uh, probably needs to be replaced. Excuse me. But if you're going to be re-gluing any of the uh, <coughs> like corks or felts or replacing any of them, you'll need some of that to hold it down to the, the metal. That is what's traditionally used. I've also got just a tiny little chunk of shellac um, for the for reseating pads if they come off. I'm not really expecting to need to. I've probably got a couple of dirty ones which maybe will want to be replaced. Um, and at least some of this shellac will usually stay in place. <coughs> there are many other things that you can use to like kind of fix them down. Um, but that's a traditional one. It works fine with me. It's really easy to apply with just heat so um, yeah that's that's effectively all I guess okay one other thing this, and this is the weirdest one probably of them this is uh, light mineral oil um, and this is actually probably more viscous than a lot of light mineral oils and it was really strange for me to find the kind of mineral oil that would be suitable I ended up using looking through a bunch of material safety data sheets to see kind of how light it actually was, how non-viscous it was, um, and I guess perhaps as you can see, this mineral oil is actually sold as a, uh, a laxative <laughs> for farm animals, of all things. Um, but it is, it is not a kind of oil that spoils. Um, it seems to be about the right viscosity to get into the, the pores of the wood and seal it up, and like I said, I've been using it for more than 10 years on multiple instruments, and it works great. It's never been a problem. Um, there's all sorts of like, I think in general instruments and repair in general, um, there's all sorts of like specific preferences and people that'll swear definitely not something and definitely not something else. Um, 
And while maybe this isn't the most ideal choice, it's certainly not the most traditional choice. Um, it's worked great for me. So, whatever that means to you. <laughs> um, but that will come up later today, since we will be oh, within the board. Um, so, to outline the work then, since we know what the tools are, uh, take the keys off, first things first, then I'll clean the body of the instrument, and then do like the polishing up the posts and that kind of thing. Um, basically all in preparation for the bore oiling, um, because the bore oil needs some time to kind of set in on it. Um, so I'd like to get to that, you know, relatively early in the whole process. Um, yeah, and then like I'll be I'll be letting it sit for long enough that like I'll be starting again tomorrow. Um, so I'll be letting it sit for long enough that it'll have plenty of time to settle in um, and not have be a problem that way. But it's it feels nice to get that out of the way. And then I think the remainder of the stream will be just polishing and cleaning up keys because that's really the longest part of this whole thing. Um, there's a lot of surface area on the total of the keys and getting the grease out of the ends and then getting any of the stuff off the bottom or in the inside or whatever and then actually polishing the whole thing is like pretty time consuming uh not the most interesting but that's kind of where it is um and then i'll break for the day i'll come back tomorrow i'll do a like a final wipe off of any residual of the bore oil and then I'll start putting stuff back on. And that's the time when, if there was corks that needed replacing, or re-gluing, or felts that needed replacing, or pads, or whatever, um, that's when it would all kind of go back on together. Um, and then when the whole thing is done, you're, you're kind of set. Um, <laughs> just, just play on it, make sure that you didn't miss any keys, count up the, the screws that you've got, you know, that whole thing. Um, and if it sounds fine, then you're basically done. Uh, I don't have... Oh, it's over here. Okay, there was one other tool that is not really, it's a more of an optional thing, and it hid from me. Um, but this little thing, uh, maybe in front of this is easier to see. You can just kind of see, it's got, it's a similar, like it's a similar in size to like a small screwdriver, but it's got like a little like hook point on it. Um, and this is called a spring hook. And basically, when you're trying to reset, like when you replace the key and you're trying to reset a spring on it, this will let you slide under it turn it around so you can grab onto the spring and then pull it out in a way that a screwdriver is much harder to manipulate for. Um, so it can be very handy for specific kinds of like spring replacement just to make it faster, make it more reliable, make sure you're not like slipping and marring the finish of the instrument. Um, in my experience you can do the exact same thing using two screwdrivers at once, you just have to be kind of more careful with it and kind of poke at it more. And yeah, So it's not, not officially like required, but useful in some cases. Uh, I'll need those for now. Get rid of most of these ones because it's time to start taking stuff apart. And I don't know, maybe this is a good, good like general setup. I think this is probably a better general camera thing. I have the other one where they're swapped, but I'm not sure what's going to be the most useful. I'm just going to put the vocal aside because aside from replacing this and maybe cleaning out the inside, which I actually have done recently, um, it's not going to need any work so I don't need to keep it on the table. Um, I guess the other thing, and where will I put this? I can see this part of the table, so maybe this is where I'll leave open. Um, when I'm, when I'm taking the, the keys off of one of these, uh, it's important to remember where all the stuff that you're taking off actually goes on the instrument. So I will generally lay them out, like, in, in a way, and then take the keys off so that you get, like, you can split... If you split the instrument down here, basically, you get keys on this side and keys on this side. And if you take them off and then you lay them to either side like this, it's pretty easy to remember where they go on again. Uh, if you're doing this kind of thing for the very first time, probably the most important thing is to just have someone around who's done similar kind of work before, so that if you get to a point where you're putting the keys back on and you can't remember what goes where, and you just haven't been able to figure it out, that there's someone there that can rescue you. Uh, the first time I did this, there was a, a well-known tech in the room, um, and he basically didn't do anything, and that was perfect, <laughs> um, because he, he set up, he set up, like, gave me a basic idea of how, how to use the tools in a way that was appropriate and, you know, careful. Um, and then I just kind of did my own thing, and he was there in case something went wrong, and I think that's really valuable. And if you're not, you know, familiar with the work, it's really useful to have someone who knows what they're doing who's, like, a reference. Um... But once you've done it a few times, it's not so bad to keep track of, it's not so bad to put, to put everything back. Uh, you can kind of make it work. 
So we'll start. Uh, basic screwdriver stuff, when you're unscrewing or screwing, you want your, your hand and your screwdriver to be more or less in a straight line, and you want that to be basically perpendicular to this head, the head of the screw. So if you're working like this or something, yeah, you can make it work, but you are more prone to slipping out of the groove of the screw. Um, and since there are gonna be flathead screws, or in some instruments, it's just gonna be pins, which you just grab with pliers and pull out, which I don't have my, my flat, uh, whatever they're called, flat nose pliers here, but they're, they're over there if I need them. Um, yeah, because they're just flathead screws, it's really easy to slide kind of laterally on it. And if you're like this, you're more likely to slide out, which is potentially not a problem. And then potentially you scratch the post or you scratch the finish of the instrument and you kind of mar things up in a, in a nasty way. So I may end up doing that on some screws by habit, but generally speaking, keeping it kind of straight in line like this, uh, putting the end of the screwdriver in the head of the screw and then putting your thumb on it so that in a rotation You can kind of reset where this the screwdriver is in the the head of the screw is is Basically the right technique to do it. That's basically what I'm gonna be doing the whole time And I think that's actually loud enough that you can probably hear That little thumping noise Yeah um, when you're backing out a screw and like especially one of these screws which goes through the key instead of just being like in the end of the key um, when you get out of the thread and you're still applying pressure to it it backs out like one thread worth and then when the pressure you're pushing on it with sets it back it makes a little thud and that tells you exactly when you're out of the, the threaded you know part of the other post um, and I'm not gonna do anything with this immediately this just comes out um, but because we want to keep track of what screw goes to what, not only just making sure we have the right number of them, but which one goes to them, because especially this kind of screw that goes through the key, um, I don't remember what it's actually called right now, um, but the kind that goes through the key um, is sized to match each individual key that it's in. So it's important that it goes back in the right one, and it may or may not fit in the other one, and you can end up with problems there if it, if it doesn't. Um, but you put it back in the key. There, that's the angle. So you've got your screw, you take it out to get the key off, you put it back in to the key there. Maybe here is better. Yeah, you can sort of see that. You can see the spring coming down too. And then you're good. You put the piece next to where it goes on the instrument, and I'll just be like leaving that side. Actually, I'll probably push this one over here and do the long joint on the end. So it'll give me a little more space to work. And then the bell is done, because the bell only has one key. You only have to worry about that. Uh, so let's do long joint next. It's here. All of them have to be done. Um, and this one is, like, there's a little bit of technique in that you have to make sure that certain screws come out first, like certain keys will come off before other ones. Usually if you run into a situation where, like, uh, I'll just do it now. Take off. How is this visible? It's sort of visible. Try to keep it up here. So this is the other kind of screw typically used on instruments. You can probably see that a little bit. It's got like a little cone end and then threads that go through the post and then the head on the other side. Um, and in this case, I took this one out and this key here it's, it's wiggling around a little bit like that, is now trapped under the other key here. So this one has to come out before this one can be removed. Um, just demonstrating that that can happen when you're not super paying attention to it. But it's easy enough to fix. You can leave it on, it'll just be there loose. Um, with this kind of screw, I screw it back into the post rather than putting it in through the, um, through the key that way. Because just it holds it on the instrument, you know the screw matches in the right place. It can actually make a difference which screw is going into the end of which rod. Um, so it's important to kind of keep track of which ones those are. And then you can take out the key that is kind of trapping the original one in. So this other pinky key over the top. And if you take it relatively slow, uh, the odds that you're going to like slip and mar something or you know anything like that are pretty low. 
provided you're comfortable using like you know hand tools if you're not super comfortable or not that comfortable you don't really have to be super comfortable if you're not comfortable using uh, like screwdrivers especially small ones uh, it's gonna be a fair amount of work of that specifically um, so keep that in mind whether whether you're, if you're deciding whether to attempt this yourself or not so now, you, now you've got these two keys as you can see off and these are both of the pinky keys and as they were they were kind of configured like this so that I took the pin out of the uh, what is it Man, I don't remember the names of any of the screws now um, but the little wedge screw <laughs> cone screw that goes in the end um, through the post. I took that one out and freed this one up, but this one was still kind of locking it in, so keep them together, put them near where they went when they came off of it, and then it'll be easy to kind of remember where they went, where they go when you put it back together. Let me see if this will show it on the other one. Yeah, there you go. There's a little bit over here, um, because this is the hole they came off of. These are the two sets of posts that they were attached to. Um, so that if I leave this in basically this orientation and I leave these here and I put this one here and then I put the other ones on the other side um, It will be very obvious as to where those keys will actually go back into Which is quite useful <laughs> uh, When it comes to like when it comes to the kind of screws that go through the keys You only have one choice of where to remove it from because there's one threaded end, there's one end with the screwdriver slot um, but when you're looking at these ones that go into uh, the end of posts and don't go all the way through the key rod itself, you often have a choice of doing one or the other side. Uh, it's going to be good. So I took out this side of this one rather than doing this side of the same one because it's much easier to access with a screwdriver. And I think that's just generally the policy you want to do. Make this as easy for yourself as possible. And you saw there, I wasn't saying anything, but there was a spring kind of holding this in place that was keeping the key from coming off easily. So to get the key off easily, you don't want to be forcing these things off. You take your screwdriver and you just kind of push on it until the, the spring disengages and then you can let it, like, this is maybe a, a thing to discuss for assembling, but the way these, uh, these little pin springs work is that, uh, how easy is that to see? Probably not very. Um, you get this little like piece of metal, this little round piece of metal that kind of sticks out towards it, and then you have this little groove in the end of a post. There, this little thing sticking down. There's a little groove on the inside of it. <laughs> Thanks. It'll be more interesting and then less probably as it progresses. <laughs> um, but there's a little groove in it that catches the spring. So if it's stuck on in here, and this one's got like a little cradle which makes it kind of hold in place. Um, try to get this back the way it was. There we go. Um, just even without this top scr spring in, screw in, um, it's kind of hard to get out because you've got the spring holding on it and then you've got this little cradle thing holding it. So you push on the spring and I'm going to push down and then move it in towards the body of the instrument so that the spring itself is moved there. And then it'll kind of go under that little bit that was clearing. So now it's spring I sprung up to the top. And now you can just take off a piece, which is very easy. Um, and as I was saying, this came out of the, whatever this is called, post in the end. So it goes back in. And by putting it back in here, we just make sure that we know which one goes where. And it doesn't like lose itself, <laughs> which they could be prone to doing. And if we got this one down here, this one will go kind of up there, which I think is off of both the cameras, but you'll, you'll see on the other joints how the, the keys are laid out. It's straightforward. You want it to be as straightforward as possible, because especially if you're not comfortable doing it, like if, you're not, if you haven't done it before and can't just kind of eyeball which key goes on next, um, it's not something you want to make a mistake and forget about. And then. Even if you do, it's not the end of the world, except then you usually have to take off a bunch of keys before you can put on the one that you forgot about. So I've got all the keys on that side of the instrument taken off. Not all that many of them, to be, to be fair. This is not a highly populated joint, but got them aligned on the board so that it's easy to tell. 
And let's do this one next. So there's a few of them, and different instruments will do this differently. Um, the last instrument I had, uh, Fox 240, had two uh, screws going through this section, and then they had like a little like over under thing. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it exactly. There's like a little bridge where they wouldn't interfere with each other. On this instrument, it's a single screw that goes through both. So, I think this is the right side, yep. Take the screw out, and you just back it out until you can feel it kind of resetting itself, until you feel the thread resetting itself. This one's quieter. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, but it does make a little bit of a noise. And this is another, another thing. Sometimes you'll grab the thing and try to pull on it, and it'll kind of feel stuck. You can use pliers, but before you do that, um, and you don't want to use your pliers too, like you don't want to squeeze too hard, hard because then you can mar the edges of the screw and, and make things rougher to assemble the next time. Um, before you do that, try wiggling around just the alignment in the post, because a lot of times there's like, in this case, there's two springs that hold these keys up. And if you just grab and pull on it like here, it kind of sticks a little bit because those ones are pushing like pushing the whole bar in this socket a little up and kind of making the whole thing bind on itself. So if you push down the top of the keys a little bit to counteract the spring, it can be significantly easier just to pull out. So in this case, I can show you this, two on the same axle, but it's actually like an axle inside of an axle. Um, and this is easier to see here. So you've got this smaller one, which this key then fits onto and then you've got the screw that actually goes through and like is the bearing of the whole thing. Get that on there. And they stick together. <laughs> yeah. It's it's important to know how to put them back. <laughs> um, and if you can if you can have a reference like that, that will that will definitely work. Um, but uh, in my case, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, I was fortunate enough to do this originally with like a repair tech around, someone who knows the instrument, you know, inside out, front ways and back ways, so that if there was ever a point where I needed the help, he, he would be able to rescue me. <laughs> it's very useful. I don't think I had to rely on it too much. Let's get some more keys off. And this is not like I was saying before that the right orientation is to kind of keep your arms straight with the axis of the screw. That wasn't really it, but yeah, it's close. This one's a tricky one because at least on this instrument, this guard, you can kind of kind of see there. It's pretty close to the top of the the uh, key, so you have to kind of like finagle it. I have to pull the key out this way, and then kind of slide it out to get it around. There are a few things like that on this instrument. Um, I think there are f there are fewer of them on a lot more kind of modern setup instruments. It's a matter of convenience, but it's it can it can be scary if you run into it and you don't like know to expect it. And then we got the D key. There's the little noise. This one's easy to do, even though it's got this little this little like scoop thing that goes underneath this key. You learn a lot about the mechanism of the instrument when you're taking it all apart like this. This side for this one. And see, not being careful with the screw head like that, or the, the head of the screwdriver, lets it jump a little. And if you jump in the wrong direction, it is possible to damage the finish. It's not great. So I will try to minimize that. My habits may not be perfect. All right. So that, I don't know how visible it is on the other camera, but that is all the keys off the long joint. So you can see a little bit of the, the layout there. Man, I should probably make another scene with just one of the cameras, but I think it's too late now. Anyway, if it's visible at all, either on either camera really, there's like a bunch of dust, that just kind of builds up under there that it's nice to get off when you clean your clean this thing off um, you can see the the springs have a little corrosion on them which really doesn't seem to be a problem 
a little oxidation at the outside of the steel. Um, but like this little groove where the, the D key lever goes um, tends to build up a lot of grime in it. Um, you can see there's like a little piece of felt on the inside of here to prevent the, the low D key like pad cup from coming up and impacting this and making noise, which is not an ideal fix, but you know, it's one that works or at least worked at the time. I don't have a problem with it now. <laughs> and that is the long joint and the bell. So now we get to somewhat more complicated ones. I will do, maybe, hmm, maybe I'll do this one in the middle. I'll do the boot last, I think. It's got the most stuff to keep track of. Though this is, I guess, the kind of front side of the boot where, uh, like, this area, this area of it, is kind of the most stacked up with keys, um, with the exception of this area on the, uh, the wing. Like, getting at the actuator under here and getting at the whisper key actually takes quite a few keys to come off. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that. And I'll start, I'll start right at the top. This is also the whisper key pad on the end here is also one of the ones that needs replacing kind of most frequently because if you get any like, you know, spit or whatever that comes out of the whisper key tone hole, it will build up on there in pretty short order. Uh, this is also the pad that always gets caught when the body lock is ac accidentally engaged or when someone's just like holding down the, uh, what's it called? The whisper key when they're assembling the instrument or whatever, it's very common to need that replaced in especially student instruments very frequently. <laughs> That's actually one that I would I would recommend people have on hand if they think they need to replace it somewhat frequently. It's cheap to get like a pair of them and it's easy to replace. There we go. Got the kind of main main mechanism of the whisper key removed and it doesn't look all that different because it's just straight down this side but now it's like uncovered a fair amount of the rest of it so now i'm gonna do i think i'll do i'll do this one next and as you may have guessed this can be a little bit messy uh for the instrument being something that you like handle every day you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be that bad for that at least but because there's all this grease on all these like little actuation points in the instrument, um, it's very easy for the grease to just rub off a little bit and you know, my fingers are already like a little bit gray on things. Um, but like if you're, don't wear your nicest pants if you're gonna keep stuff in your lap and that kind of thing because it will be a problem eventually if you let it be. Uh, I'm gonna put these on the outside so I want these a little farther in. So now I'm gonna get the, the front ones off here. And these are both uh, straight through ones. Oh, this is something worth mentioning. If you're getting one of the screws that goes straight through the, the mechanism like this, and, and like has the screw going through all of it, not just the ones on the ends, then it's gonna be with your smaller 1.5 millimeter screwdriver. Um, and then if you're using one of these ones that are just in the end, how visible is that? One of these screws that just sticks out a little bit into the into the end of the rod, uh, you'll be using the 2.5 millimeter one mostly. There's one screw on my instrument that goes all the way through and fits better with the 2.5 millimeter. But generally, the ones that go straight through are narrower enough that you can actually get the 2.5 millimeter screwdriver into the end. So you really do kind of need both sizes, or, or both approximately of that size, uh, to do like a full maintenance thing can feel a little bump. This one also has pretty strong strength springs, so I know that this one is hard to remove even when it's like properly disengaged. I actually might get the pliers for this. Because it is definitely disengaged. Oh. And this is something where I like I like to just kind of like push on it, like push on the the like body of the key, not the body, the like the rod of the key a little bit because just finding like a a point where it seems to want to unbind can be enough to get it to go. It's not now, so I'm gonna go get my, my flat-ended pliers. Mm -hmm. 
parallel tires. That's what these are called. I'll eventually remember the names for things. Um, these are kind of neat because, if you can see, uh, normal pliers will come together. Actually, I have normal pliers around. They come together and kind of, you know, you get, as they close, this end is wider and this end is narrower and you get close together like this. These ones are set up so that when you close them, it's parallel the whole time. And that can be really useful for gripping certain kinds of things. In this case, I like them because they don't have any teeth on the inside. So that while they don't grip as strong, they also don't mar the thing that you're gripping. Which is nice for these, these screws. Because you can get a little bit more kind of pulling strength out of them. Without really risking the, the smoothness of the metal that you're pulling on. And this is a very long one, as you can see. It goes through both keys. This also, this key looks kind of funny. I've got an interesting little mechanism on my instrument where the high E can be the normal high E key that you'd have up on the top, but I've also got like a one that's on the top of the high E flat, which I find pretty handy, actually. It's a nice little addition. I don't know who did it or if it was original to the instrument, but it was it's a good choice. And that is the end to take out of this side. I think. The lighting is not ideal for finding these screw heads as they're embedded in posts. <laughs> we'll figure it out. There it is. <laughs> Just trying to work methodically gives you the best results. And this is a good example actually of why it's important to match the rod that you remove with the other one. Because not only does the does the like uh, length differ, but the thickness differs. You can see like the rod I just removed from this ring key um, is like twice the diameter of the one that I removed in the uh, Luby flight key for the bell. And if you forget about it and you just kind of leave them all in a question like air in a collection then yeah they're more likely to be lost and that's bad in itself but it can also be really confusing to try to figure out which one goes to which even if they're you know the lengths are this distinct uh, let's see now I'm going to go for I guess you th this will be different on different instruments but you have to kind of look to see which of the edges of things you have access to and I have a bunch of access points in this because these two are on the outside um, but I can take these two off and then take these two out. If I only take one of them out because of the way they're arranged, it'll actually trap the other one in, so I have to do these two together. Um, I can take this one out because it's on the outside facing screw. I can take this one out because it's the outside facing screw, but the whisper key and this little bridge under the, the flick keys, or the C-sharp and the B-flick, um, are both under enough stuff that I need to do those later. So there is a little bit of foresight recommended for this. But, uh, you know, you take a look at what you've got, and you can probably figure out the next step. Is that the right side? That is the right side. Where are you, screw head? Thread? And just by, uh, probably can't see, but just by keeping your thumb, like, right along the, the seam between the top of the screw thread and the screwdriver, means that you can back it out and kind of correct it every turn. If it's if your screw if your screwdriver is coming out of it a little bit, it just will kind of be auto-corrected. Which is very useful. Got that one. Could do the whisper key now, but I'm going to do I think these two. And I've already gotten a little bit of grease in my pants. This is why Tex will wear like a little smock thing. Which is pants that they don't particularly care about. So. Since this one needs to have both removed at once, because just removing one will trap the other key, I'm pushing down on the key, so if 
I should do more of this up here. I'm pushing down on the key so that I can keep it from binding here. I'm going to remember that this one goes on this side, on the right side. Pull the other one out. And now let you just let up the pressure on the keys and the springs underneath them raise them out of it. Then you can put them back in their respective places. And then put them over for where, the, where they'll lie on the side, which is useful. Let's get this one. And I'll try to do more of this on top. In the off chance that I do something strange and interesting or useful with the screwdriver, uh, at least now you can see it. You can, right? Yeah, okay. So this is another one that goes under here. That's the, the A flick key. And then you got these two, this little bridge, kind of F-shaped, reverse F-shaped <laughs> uh, fork key. And then the whisper key, which is oddly on this instrument, the threaded end is here and the, the screw head is here. So you always have to put that one in last. Um, and I, have, I believe I have done the opposite before and screwed it up at least once and then had to take a bunch of keys off to put the whisper key back on because You'd think it would be on the outward facing one, but uh, for some reason it's not. And this is another one where the spring holds it in place. And the spring is like pretty substantial on that key. So it will hold it kind of stiffly. Get the screw back in the post. And put it under. And the whisper key. And that is all the keys in the wing. And you can kind of see, it's kind of complicated looking, like with all the keys off. I guess it's complicated looking with them on as well. Um, but you got to like a lot of holes, you've got a lot of springs and stuff sticking out. Um, when you actually go through and clean this, I'll be doing that later. Um, you got to be careful of like poking yourself on the springs. <laughs> they will draw blood. That has definitely happened before. Um, but yeah, it's it's much, much lighter with the keys off. It's always kind of a surprising thing. And now we've got one more joint to go. And this is the most complicated one. Um, not that it's any different, really, than the other side. Just that there's more stuff to do. And one of those things is taking off the B-flat guard. Because the screw that actuates, or doesn't actuate, um, that is like the bearing that the B-flat key actuates around, goes straight under the guard, in, at least in this instrument. So this is the only screws that for this overhaul that I have to remove that are not into metal. These actually are threaded directly into the body of the instrument. And it's not, not the best for durability, I would say. But as long as you're you're not over torquing them in either direction, you're careful about you know doing it. Um, I haven't done any damage that I've seen to the wood by removing them and putting them back in several times. Um, they are then loose screws. You can put them back in here. I think I have before, but I think in this case, uh, my preference. This will be be like that probably. Um, so it'll be on this side. My preference is to just put them in the. Uh, the guard that they came from because there are little holes there that will not really hold them but like kind of keep them captive a little bit and then you can actually start taking off these so I guess B flat key will be first now I think if you go to like a professional tech that works on bassoons a lot they will have like a cradle for the instrument when they're working on it like this um, and that would be great to have but like 
it's just the weight of the instrument itself and I went and put uh, these are just like rags on the top of my uh, kitchen table and while it's not you know the gentlest cradling thing that I could have for my my fancy instrument um, it should be fine for keeping the finish from being marred, keeping the keys from being bent, that kind of thing. Because it's really only the weight of the instrument itself. Now, I didn't feel it disengage, but I felt like I went for long enough that it did. Yeah, it definitely feels like it, it's out. Okay, just had to wiggle it. There you go. And this is on this side and under this key. So that goes over there. That doesn't look ideal. I'll have to take a look at that later, but... There might have been a little bit of water in this B-flat key. You can, you can sort of see. Uh, it's this way. Just right here. There's like a little, little bit of darkness outside of there, which is not great looking. Now, I know that these were, like, the keys of the inside of these were uh, darkened before. I don't know if that was uh, originally some kind of ceiling thing or if that, that was previous damage. Um, but I don't remember it looking quite the way it does now, so that could be a sign of something. One of the nice things about doing this yearly is that if you're taking care of your instrument, it's going to change very little year to year. So you get to see, like, if you notice differences, like significant differences in, in the way it looks and the way it's set up, um, eh. you can kind of tell what's going on. And if there really is a problem, you can kind of preempt it in some cases. This is the other side of the B flat key. Now I will do, yeah, let's do this E key. And this one, this one is one that it looks like it should just swing out, but the spring is right under there and it's fairly strong. So rather than swinging out, I try to pull it off of the other side screw. It works pretty well. Now we got these two and the ones on top. So I've actually exposed one already. These are something you have to be careful about on the boot. These little pins. And the reason is not that the pins are particularly fragile or particularly interesting, but that there's three or four in each instrument. And in this, in this case, there's four in mine, because I've got a... This is on the A-flat key. The mechanism is the same front and back, where on some instruments it's actually a different key. Um, but anyway, they're all different lengths. It's going to be usually the, the longest one towards the top and the shortest one at the bottom, because of the, the taper of the thickness of the instrument that you can kind of see. Um... But it's important that you have all of them when you return them back, and that they go in the right order. So I will I will be working on this side until all these keys are off, so I won't be dumping them out immediately. Um, but you do want to be careful about like turning it over, because they will just fall out. Um, and then you need to figure out how you're going to arrange them on the, you know, on the space you're using um, before you flip it over and dump them somewhere and forget what direction they are and where they go and all that kind of stuff. Because they'll, they'll always fit in. Like, they're the same thickness of rod. They will always fit into the next thing. So it's not until you put the key on the other side and then realize that the key height's way wrong because you put the wrong rod in the right place. Or the, wrong, the right rod in the wrong place or whatever permutation of that you want. So it is important to keep track of them to save yourself the, the headache changing that around later. Got a couple more that slipped off there. Not so great. Should be more careful. I definitely heard it that time. Spring engaged. There we go. These ones are, will be... Actually, let me just shift these all up. These are just too close to me. I want the space in front for working because that's where the camera is. Uh, let's see. So I could do I could do this one, but it would be under this key. Um, I have remembered just from working on it in the past that this key uh, is a little bit of a weird one in that you take this key off and then in this little gap, uh, it's hard to see probably, but in this little gap here, you can get 
the screwdriver that is required to get the one out of it. I don't know why they left it, why they left the the head like in this location, but different manufacturers will be set up differently, and I imagine even like this is a 9000 series cycle, um, but I imagine other like later models will have this moved around a little bit. The key work kind of constantly changes. This just makes it really weird to remove because then you're pulling the, you can see that, you're pulling this um, screw out over the little ledge that you have in the other key. Uh, this one goes higher up. Spread this out a little. The placement of them on the mat doesn't have to be exact, but it does help you keep track, so it's worth paying attention to. another one with the spring holding it in place. This is also something I've already done to my instrument, but if you are feeling uh, well, particularly bold and you have a key that is like really pressing down hard, when you have these off is an opportunity to check spring tension and change things as they're needed. The caution would be that the more spring tension you have, the more force that pad is getting to close, and uh, the less leaky, leaky it's going to be for the same like quality of pad and quality of seal. So yeah, you can make it easier to play your instrument like by like lightening up the springs on the keys, um, but it, if you lighten up too far, it'll just slow the return on them. And then if you lighten up a little, if it's not, if it's not a really supple pad or if it's a little out of alignment in the seal or something, um, you can just run into a problem. What was I saying? Give me a second. <laughs> you can just run into a problem where you create like little micro leaks in things. Um, and they can be difficult to troubleshoot. So it, I, I am for, especially on an instrument like this where I have no rollers whatsoever, I am definitely for um, lightening up springs when possible to make the, the action a little bit smoother. Um, I did that a while back, so I'm not going to do anything for that now. But you do have to be kind of especially careful, careful. There is a reason why they're pushing harder. Sometimes it's because they didn't undo the extra force. Sometimes it's because the extra force is important for sealing. I will put these these pins. I'll put one on this side with the B flat key, and then I'll lighten the other ones up just in order coming down, so that I can I can know what order they go in when I put it all back together. Important. Now if I turn it over, none of them fall out. So you get, get some keys flapping around a little bit. And that's half of the boot joint. So now we do the other half. And you do have to be careful a little bit. These springs, like I said, they will draw blood. Um, depending on what you like rest it on. If you just rest it there, it's probably fine. If you slide it to either side, you might stab yourself. So do be careful. <laughs> I will do this one on the end, which actually is kind of a problem child on this instrument because there's not a lot of clearance to get it out. It'll, like, it'll come out fine, but uh, you'll have to wiggle it around and kind of turn the angle a little bit for it to actually come out all the way. That's all the way up top on the other side. Right, where to start here? Let's start with the A flat key. This is another one where the, the keys are stacked up in kind of unintuitive way. So if you need to take a second to kind of Remember how things are stacked and get a plan for what order you want to take them off in. It is worth taking the time. This is doubly important when you go to put it back together. But it still counts for something when you're taking it off because you don't want to just have like a key flapping around that is captive because of something else. Here. 
it's useful for me as well when you're laying laying the like keys out for each section to try to put a little gap between the like the the joints, the keys from each joint, um, just to kind of further delineate. Make sure you understand that they belong to different joints, so you're not as confused when you start back up. I've done it enough that it's probably not a problem if I don't, but you know, good practice. didn't hear a little thumping, but I'm pretty sure that's out. Let's see if I can grab it with the pliers. There we go. There's a little F sharp key that goes on top of everything and is hard to reach. Very important. Now this one, I believe I know from experience, doesn't come out easily um, on either side. But I'll do this top one first. Okay. Put the screw back in the end. Orient this in the way that I was going to do it. Okay, this goes up here. I guess it goes in the opposite direction, actually. Now, this is this is the key that I mentioned earlier, where uh, it's the it's an inset, like it's a rod that goes through about this much of the key, and then it's it's very interesting because it's a, a rod in here, and then it's like one of these um, pivot screws in the end of here. Um, so it kind of is both kinds of screws, and it will work with this one, but I think, yeah, it's like just, just a little thicker than the others, and just big enough that it's actually better to do with the large screwdriver. And the idea is basically that you can use a small screwdriver for basically whatever, you know, anything you can get into it that it's not so big that the screwdriver just like turns over in the end well, a little slot for it. Um, but it's going to slip out much more often if you're using one that's too small for it. So if you can use a bigger screwdriver on the same screw, it's usually a better choice. I don't know if I can use either side. I think I've been taking it off of this side before, though. I don't remember. That's one thing with these pivot screws. Uh, if you've got an instrument that hasn't been serviced in a while, sometimes they'll just kind of be locked in place. And on some of them, on some keys, but not all, um, you have the option of just trying the other screw. And if one of them is not moving, as long as you can get to the other one without, you know, significant trouble, uh, it's probably worth just doing that. You know, not, not forcing it or anything. Screws can get stuck. If you're doing this kind of regular surfacing, the likelihood that it will get stuck is very small. At least it will in the future. But that, that first time it loosens up, can be tricky. All right, so put that one over here, and that is all the all the keys off of the boot joint. So the next step is to take the cap off and take the U-tube off because in oiling the bore, we we want to we want to get the oil down the whole thing, and one side of the bore, the small side of the bore, is you can see maybe a little from this end. There's this side, excuse me, that has like a liner, like a brass liner up here. And that actually extends with a rubber liner down the entire length of that side of the bore. And then the other side is just bare wood. Um, so we'll see that when we open this up. But when we want to, uh, there we go. It's always pretty bright in there because it's silver that hasn't seen much air. I'll put that up here. It doesn't matter as much. I'll know where that goes. Um, but what, what was I saying? Um, Right, when we're, when we're oiling the bore, we want to oil all the wood inside, but you don't want to oil the uh, liner section. It doesn't help at all. Um, so, we take off the U-tube, in this case with mine. These are just thumb screws that I have been careful to only make thumb, 
thumb screw tight other times I've done this. You take those two off. And this whole time you have to be very careful. The YouTube is made of soft brass. If you drop the instrument when it is like this, uh, that brass will dent and then your instrument will sound totally different. So you don't, you don't want to be messing with it like this. You don't want to leave it with the boot cap off for any length of time. And then, it's not super easy. I wasn't really expecting it to. Um, so this is usually the method that I've used here. And the idea is that you are effectively using a screwdriver to lever the two ends, the base of the boot cap and the, uh, the plate that goes in the bottom of the instrument apart. And you do this very lightly, um, but by getting a screwdriver kind of into this little wedge, that is, you, you put it in flat, and then you rotate it up. And by rotating it up, it forces the two sides apart at that little point. And if you do that just a little, you break the seal. I don't know if you could actually hear that. And then you can just remove it. And it looks like mine is in pretty good shape. It's nice. Because it's kind of a pain to <laughs> to remake this gasket um, if you don't have, like... I don't know. I, I don't know if they would do this with a punch at a shop normally. Um, if you had a punch for it, it would be super easy to do. But I think even if they had a punch, there would probably be some fitting to with the individual instrument because the base is a little different and everything. Um, so, yeah, it's... I'm not great at working with cork. I don't want to have to deal with it. I'm glad that it came off well and that it looks like it's in good shape. Like I don't see any rips. Um, it doesn't feel hard at all. And before I put this back, though this will be tomorrow, um, I'll just give it a little bit of a coat of cork grease because a little bit of cork grease on it will kind of help keep it supple and good for the next time. Also helps keep the seal and all that stuff, you know, good for protection. Uh, I apparently did need to swab my instrument just a little because there's just a little condensation in the bottom. <laughs> so I'll get that. And this will be cleaned more thoroughly as I go forward, just getting stuff off for now. But that is the full disassembly. Let's see if the other camera is showing. Yeah, it shows a little bit more, I guess. But you can kind of see all the keys are arranged with the joints they came off of, and everything's all set. So the next step is to clean off the uh, the joints to the point that I can like actually put the, the bore oil on, on them. So this is usually done for me in a couple of passes. I'll do a pass with a paper towel generally. Well, I think I've done it with a paper towel before. I don't know if I want to this time. It's about rationing how many cloths you're using. Maybe I'll, maybe I still will. All right. The problem with the paper towel is that using paper stuff is very slightly abrasive, even if it doesn't feel like it to you. Um, and that's not great for the finish of the instrument. So I guess with that in mind, I just won't this time. I'll just use this cloth. If it gets dirty, I'll just have to find another one for when I'm reassembling. Um, but I'm going to go over everything with the cloth first because it's going to help get the grease off. And uh, then I'll go over with the silver polishing cloth once everything is kind of like cleaned up a bit. And there's, n other than trying not to stab yourself with the springs, <laughs> there's nothing too involved with this. It's just time consuming. So you go, you go over, you try to kind of get the cloth over the end of every uh, pivot point. What are they called? I'm forgetting all of the names for these things. Post. Yeah, every post. Whether it's the kind that has the screw in there, it's the, for the pivot screws, or if it's the kind that has the rod screws that go through the whole thing. And you just get the cloth over, and you get some of the gunk off. And you may find, like this one slightly, that you can feel just a tiny bit of play uh, in the post. And if that's particularly bad, it should be fixed, um, set with epoxy or something similar. Uh, I don't recommend doing it yourself unless you're comfortable with that kind of thing. Um, but if it's a very small amount, you, it will probably go back together fine. It's just that it can lead to binding or looseness or both in the future. Yeah, you can see how much grease comes off of there. Just There's just one joint with like not even that many keys. But you get in there, try to get the grease off. And then when it's when it's better for that, <laughs> um, you can actually come in with like the polishing cloth. Uh, and I think will I do that? I think I also want to do like a once over of the the finish of the instrument. 
Um, which maybe, I think I'll do second. Do the silver cloth and then do that. So this will be my, my dirty one <laughs> um, for all the grease. And then I'll do the silver polishing just to make the posts extra shiny and all that stuff. And then one final run over with the microfiber just to just to get any gunk off of the finish that was not coming off initially. Um, and this is not something you should the this like treated side of the silver cloth is not something you should be you know like rubbing on the finish much. It's not good for the wood, I imagine. Um, but getting it on there like it, making contact is not really a problem. So. The goal is to get the tarnish off the posts, and I'll show you what I can. It can be tough to see in, in the light because of the way reflections kind of work, um, but it, it is a staggering difference how how clean they get with just a little polishing. Like, and I think mine are they tend to just oxidize a lot more than some people's instruments, so they look darker to start with. But I don't know if this is visible. But like I cleaned this one and this one is not and the difference on the camera doesn't look like gigantic really maybe this is for a different setup it doesn't look enormous between this one and like this or this or one of those because there's still like some shine to the other ones right but i don't know maybe you can see it more on the side like it's it's really significantly cleaner and brighter looking than before, and just in that, ooh, there it is, just in that, I've pulled off that much tarnish. So, this is the time-consuming part. <laughs> but if you want your instrument to be shiny and clean, it is worth the effort, I think. And then when you get to, I sh should be doing this up, I guess. Um, when you get to these, like, uh, they're kind of like posts, but they've been, like, have a had a channel cut out of them for the key to go through. You can kind of just, like, scrunch up a little bit and then work it in and out like that. Glossing, effectively. And then you can get the inside cleaned out, too. And this is the super exciting, <laughs> tedious part of this. <laughs> yeah, my, mine was the same way. This is normally an every year during the summer kind of thing. Um, and I actually worked on a student's instrument over this summer. And even though there was like ample time to do it, and I actually wasn't even playing that much then, I just for some reason didn't get myself to actually do it. So this is the year and a half mark where I normally do it every year. And it's, it'll get done. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. I don't know how visible this is. I, I assume not very visible. Um, it's not especially interesting. But this is a video, so it's good to get it on the video. Uh, maybe this will be a good demonstration of the shiny differences. Because, um, so that, where is it? this piece right here, this like flat one, like just, just the difference that makes is massive. Like it, it works, the, the treated stuff works really fast. And if you did the same thing with just like a regular cloth, a little bit would come off, but it would not, you know, remove the tarnish like this does. Nothing close. So, try to move all these out of the way so I can just be up here more. Keep that over there. What, what happened to it? Any damage? I actually, this is something that I could kind of see before on this instrument, but it's, I don't know if this is even slightly visible here, but if you look in that tone hole, this one right here, um, 
probably needs like some extra brightness for that to work. Um, but you can actually see a seam where this whole end of the instrument was replaced. This, this instrument at some point had this whole tenon replaced. Um, and it's not super obvious from the ex exterior. Yeah. Especially, especially when it's, it's not a busy time, you know, <laughs> it's good to do. Like, for as tedious as this is, it, it really is like, I don't know, rewarding in a sense, because of, because of how, like, shiny it gets. <laughs> oh, jeez. Man, that's rough. I mean, I mean it's, it is amazing the, the kind of, like, uh, repair work that, like, a good tech can do, because, I, I mean, like, like, this instrument has had, like, just entire like chunks of the board replaced <laughs> um, and, it, and it sounds great like this has been a fantastic instrument and I, I don't even know when that repair was made uh, but it is never it is never nice to even think about that kind of stuff happening to a horn yeah maybe this will be a good example as well if I'm over here it's easier to see okay so this this guard Now it's nice and shiny. <laughs> yeah, I'm fortunate to be, uh, fortunate to, in a way, uh, to be the only occupant of my living room. So I have been able to be pretty careful about it. Not guaranteed, even then, but at least more likely to be okay. Getting out of this guard is always kind of a pain. It doesn't matter a lot because it's not really an area that's going to be seen, but it's nice, nice to know that it's cleaned up at least. I feel like it's good practice. And the table isn't shaking too much. I'm used to doing this on a card table. This kitchen table works much better. That looks pretty good. I think I have to do these ones. So I only did kind of straight down the side. <laughs> yeah, it, they, they certainly happen. It's a shame that they happen, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's interesting, these silver polishing cloths are actually okay at polishing non-silver things. Um, like I've actually these will shine up the brass on the instrument pretty well. Not that it matters, and, and not that it maybe requires it. Maybe it's just that the brass will shine if you just polish it with anything, and the cloth happens to do the trick. But I think the chemical plays some role in that. Let's do you here. That looks pretty good. Yeah. So we'll do that on the brass rings on the end. Protecting the ends of the tenons. And yeah, that's definitely like, it's shinier and it's quickly shinier. It's a good look. That one's not as dramatic yet. It's a little shinier. All right. So that's the, the damage so far on the silver polishing cloth. And actually, most of the cl this cloth will go towards the keys, um, so the, it is yet to come. And now I'm trying to get a little bit of this, this grime on the finish off. It will be the last bit of cleaning on this joint. And if you're going to be like kind of buffing like this, it is, well, I guess this is not, I think this is not a, uh, what's it called? Uh, a natural fiber cloth. Uh, but you do want to be careful about the the cloth you're using.
because it is possible to introduce scratches. And I think in a lot of finishes that might not be all that observable. But it's not something you want to be in the habit of at least. Oh, I guess I didn't do any dusting, so I'll have to do that as well. And this, this part when you're working on the body is the one where you're most likely to run into your own hands with a spring. So you do have to be careful where you're aiming. This is an area I have to be careful of because it's got some grime on it because this is a point where the hand contacts but it's also got cracks in the finish here Ooh, and I did get a little flake of it off so I want to minimize that I know it's going away I know it's not going to last forever but I don't want to encourage it to be coming off sooner <laughs> I kind of wish the finish on this instrument didn't have the uh, the like hard shell coating. It was just like the original oil finish or something. Because even though it's supposed to be less durable, like the the way it wears, isn't isn't crackly like this, which I think is the less appealing look. Like I don't I don't mind the uh, where, where is it There it is. I don't mind that like kind of light area where you can just see the wood, um, but the edges of it being all like crackly doesn't look the best in my opinion looks pretty good. This is not as shiny as it will get because the oiling, the bore oiling, always feels like it kind of makes it look like it's been waxed as well. Um, so it'll be nice and shiny after that. But this looks pretty clean. Now the paintbrush, just to get in the crevices, make sure there's no stray dust that gets to stick around. This is actually pretty good for, for dusting around the posts and things too, because the claws are never going to get quite all the way in, where the bristles of a brush usually will. And I'll call that done. Looks pretty clean in there. All good. And then we move on to the next one. I'll just toss these down here. Yeah, uh, the one piece. I mean, you get stuff like this, which is like the, well, stuff like this, which is like the typical look for my instrument after it's been going for a while. Like, I like the blues and things, but like, that's supposed to be bright silver. <laughs> it's a very different look. So first we get the grime off the posts for the grease. And sometimes you can actually see like a little dust in here. It doesn't actually look bad now. But if you leave it out uh, in the air, that will sometimes happen. We'll do the silver. This is the easiest joint by far. Very little to do on it. And that's already like so much shinier. There is a little when you when you have a tarnish buildup that is this significant, there's gonna be like especially when you do like a wide open area like this, there tends to be like little areas that remain cloudy. 
even after like the rest of it kind of shines up. I don't know exactly why, whether that's like a pressure applied in different areas kind of thing, or if that's actually like a thickness of the tarnish kind of thing. But it's, it's been consistent like that, so you do have to kind of check your work. Oh, that's no problem. I expect to be here for another hour or two polishing keys. <laughs> Flossing, which you cannot see. No, you still can. Okay, so this is not the best camera setup for this. The other one is going to be better. That looks relatively shiny. Switch to the other one. There we go. Uh, now I do the finish. You don't have to be super careful with this joint because there is not a spring on it. The spring is on the key, and there's only one. <laughs> so everything should be blunt. Alright, two down, but it's like the easiest two. Good to be hydrated. Come on. All right, onto the boot. So, let's see, get this one. And start going over to get the grease off. This one is uh, grimier in a way. It's not really that like the boot gets that much more handling or like a uh, little drop with the spit or whatever. But there's like so many things on it that it collects under stuff a lot more. There's lots of space that is at least partially covered that maybe something can get in but it can't get out. So it does seem to build up here a little bit more. Uh, same same goes with the wing though not unique in that regard and I will do I'm just gonna kind of clean everything about this joint I'm like I'm not gonna do the same thing and then come back to do extra stuff so uh, right around where the gasket seals against the YouTube it's good to go once over that and see if anything has built up in that little seam in this case it doesn't seem like anything really has but it's good to check if you have stuff building up in that seam around the gasket, it probably means the gasket doesn't fit quite right, and it could mean that if you let it go for long enough, that could, you know, either damage the gasket or damage the wood at the bottom of the instrument, or both. Good to keep an eye on. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember what the the B flat tone holes looked like uh, the last time I surfaced this. That 
looks pretty good for the grease. I think what I'm gonna do, and maybe I'll maybe I'll do another step as a step or two of cleaning before I do this. I think I'm gonna take a picture of these these keys um, because I don't think I don't think it warrants anything today. Like I'm not seeing like breakage or or build up in a way that seems particularly problematic. Um, but it would be useful to have a picture to compare it to next time that I do this. Uh, to see if it's getting any worse, because if it is, then, then there's a, a leak somewhere that's bad and needs to be fixed. Um, that's the next one. Polishing, that's what I've been doing. And this has also got some weird ones to polish, because some of this, like, bodywork metal um, is under things or beside things in a really weird way. It's worth mentioning that I didn't take the... Uh, like, even though I took all the keys off, I didn't take the whisper key lock off. Um, I have never had run into an issue with this one being noisy or stuck or anything like that. Um, the mechanism of it is a little unusual for some. It's also uh, in a place where it's screwed directly into the body of the instrument, so removing it is another one of, you know, removing wood screws instead of machine screws from, po from metal posts. So I'm... Like, somewhat more hesitant to do it just on that. And then it hasn't been a problem, so I haven't really been doing it. Should do this up here. You can see all the tarnish coming off. I've been doing this for years, and it's still amazing <laughs> how quickly this stuff comes off with this treated cloth. Because you have this tarnish that builds up over the whole year, just from you know natural oxidation and handling and that kind of thing, and then it takes you know five or ten strokes of this cloth with a little bit of reagent of whatever, whatever kind it is, and it's fine, nice and shiny and new. And I don't think it removes all that much of the silver either. I know the plating for instruments tends to be relatively thick, so I'm not sure how much of a concern that is directly. Maybe if you do this frequently enough, then it can be. But given that I'm like I'm seeing the dark on the cloth and, and a little less the, the straight up gray, and given that I've done it for a while on the same instrument and haven't like worn through the plating, um, I doubt it's taken off too much, which is great. get around the ring. It's looking better. How about through the ring? You have to get creative. Just to get into the little crevices. And if I took the this plate off, then you know it will be easier to get out again. But Again, it screws into the wood, and I know that that can cause wear that will, you know, potentially wear out the wood in a way that is very difficult to deal with. Um, I know that, like, screws can be reset, and you can fill that and that kind of thing. And this is not an area where it would be, like, critical to the acoustics of the instrument, but something about wearing out the wood is not a good feeling for me. So it's not something I do in this work, at least. If I, if I had a compelling reason to do so, like taking off the B-flat guard to get at the B-flat key, 
Um, but yeah, you got to do it. But not here. Let's do a little of this. A little, a little under this whisper key lock, though. It's catching on something. Probably got a little bit out. plates inside of it. An interesting construction to this lock. Because it's basically just got like a body that it slides in and a cap on top. But the body it slides in seems to be lined with steel or something. So it's made to be a little more durable than the the metal used otherwise. That looks pretty good. to the brass liner for the wing joint. Makes it a little shinier, gets a little gunk off. It's always good. Uh, let's do the guard as well. This is a curiosity about my instrument. Um, in place of the normal like uh, hand guard that you'd have with the crotch and everything, uh, I just got a counter bassoon guard. And it was pretty strange initially getting used to it, but I, I do find that it works pretty well. Like it it's, gives you an anchor point kind of right under your first finger. Um, and it has been adequate. I think, especially when standing and playing, I would prefer to have the the full hand guard because then, because it's sticking up farther, you have like more lateral control over the shake of the instrument. Um, and I think that would be good because I do run into some occasional issues where I have to like kind of change my grip in a weird way to do technical stuff while standing. And I think if I didn't have to, I would probably have slightly better technique while standing. Um, because I, th I think changing the orientation of your hands can cause issues for that, just generally speaking. Get up under there. Do some flossing in there. Uh, but this, this guard has basically worked fine. So I can't really complain. Whoever added it was on to something. I, like there is, there is markings from the original, uh, whatever that's called, the holder for, for the crutch, the post. Uh, there's markings for the original screws there, and they have been filled in and finished over. It looks like, so it was done a while ago that it was added, but this configuration does work. I won't whine about it too much. Gradually getting through these posts. It's just time consuming. I think, on the whole, I expect this with that little bit of like introduction that I did in the disorganization at the beginning of the stream, trying to get the set camera set up better. Um, maybe five and a half or six hours in total, um, but that's not going to be all today. Mm, like sixty percent today, maybe, maybe a little more. Cleaning is definitely the longest step. Or the longest active step, I guess, since you're waiting at least 12 hours for the bore oil. But you don't have to do anything. Oh, 
looks pretty shiny. Yeah, even though it's, even though they're brass, these tubes that extend from the body, they really do look shinier when you run it over with these things, so it's worth the effort, I think. Minimal extra. this one and I think this cleaning would be faster if the screws were not in uh, but then it would be much 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 harder to remember how the whole thing went together uh, I think techs that do this will generally have like a, a paper map like a full-size paper map of where things go so that when I take the screws off they can just put them in the place they go on the map and then you know you know exactly where it goes and it doesn't have to be near or related to the instrument um, and that's a great system but it takes up more <laughs> space and, and stuff than I currently have so it is not currently the system that I'm using much more basic you can kind of see what it does to your fingers it does come off, like this is not particularly staining. But you will, like some of that tarnish that's coming off on the cloth will certainly then come off onto you as well. Another vote for don't use your best clothes. And make sure the cloth you're resting stuff on is one that you don't care too much about keeping clean. And beware of the springs. Always a good policy. looking better. It's got so many screws in it, it's hard to get all the little gaps. Let's do this. Lots and lots of polishing. This is getting there. Almost done with the posts on this joint. Which, yeah, maybe this, I think the boot probably does take a little longer to do all the metal work that's sucked down. Um, Cause it's just kind of harder to get into little crevices and that's what ends up taking a lot of time. Polishing the outside of a post is not, you know, particularly demanding in terms of time. But getting in between everything takes a little bit, takes a little extra effort. This one. Caught a spring on something. Thanks for following while I polish for half an hour or whatever this is. Not the most riveting content probably, but you know, 
It'll do for now. It needs to be done to the instrument, at least. Is that almost done? It's starting to look fairly shiny. I like it. Might be a couple little touch-up places to do. But that looks like I haven't missed anything. Which is always good. I can do a little on this one. Yeah, sometimes you go around these and you just have to like scrunch the fabric up more so that it kind of gets into the crevices better. Because like I'm seeing that like the the like ball head on the posts is fine and nice and shiny, but the little part that holds it up gets a lot less contact. But that looks pretty good. So on to not silver, but like body cleaning. Should need a lot less of this. Then I'll go through the uh, tone holes with brushes. Get all the grime. Don't catch the cloth on the springs. Don't stab the fingers with them either. All solid plants. Actually, no, it's still not, it's still not a light worth of sound. You might be able to hear very, very faintly a little bit of guitar playing. My upstairs neighbor is playing again. I know the mics are pretty sensitive, so there's a chance that you can hear it. It's looking shinier. All right, looking pretty good. Now the tone holes, which I haven't done yet because none of the tone holes on these other two, on the long joiner on the bell, are really like long enough to justify this, or not long enough, um, <laughs> long enough. I guess they're not long either, but it's narrow enough because these brushes are, you know, this one's not all that wide, the other one's a little wider. Um, if you're not actually gonna be making contact with the sides of the hole, there's not really much of a point. Um, so you have to usually go like reasonably far up the, on the instrument before the brushes will. I'm getting very little grime out of the ones on the like thumb side of the boot. But these ones, these tone holes that are not key covered, uh, they tend to be keys that get water in them. They tend to be grimy, so worth doing, I think. Maybe doing in a couple passes. I have a bigger brush that might be better suited to these ones. You can always blow them out as well, but like unless it's dust, that's not really going to remove anything. Uh, that's the bigger one. And the helpful thing about this one, why I don't really have any problems stabbing it into the bore, is that it's got this little, it's the, the end, which would normally just be kind of clipped wire, is dipped. So, well, I don't want to, like, jab it in too hard. Um, 
it's not so risky to do. And though that will just, what I just did, will just knock that stuff into the bore, I'm going to be going through that anyway with, you know, the normal cleaning claws, or with the, what is that? Oh, there's like a little finish on the inside of it. Oops. Didn't even notice that from before. Um, but yeah, if this knocks it into the bore, I'll just clean it out with the regular cleaning utensils. Shouldn't actually be a problem. Um, is there another thing to do to this one? I don't think so. Oh, uh, yes. Because especially after doing the tone holes, there's these, like, these wells. You can kind of see. A little hard to see in the light. I don't know why it's this dark. I've boosted it quite considerably. And it looks fine to me, like, visually. Um, a little grime that didn't come off on the first pass. Alright, so I'll get that as well. Um, but there's these little wells around these tone holes. Um, the tone hole liners, I guess. Since these are the metal liners that come out of the holes. But they tend to trap gunk. <laughs> Just like all the little crevices on the instrument. Um, so it is worth dusting them out, kind of even if you don't see something wrong with it, because you'll probably still get a little dust out. And there's nothing special about the technique for this. You just try to avoid running into the posts with the, uh, like, ferrule, ferrule that holds the bristles together, because that can scratch the posts or the finish or whatever it's running into, since it's metal. That looks pretty solid. <laughs> All right, three down, one more to go. Then I can do bore oiling and then it's on to <laughs> even more polishing, but it's the keys. All right, so first things first, get the grease off. Just make sure it's not still on there. Definitely some grease on these. You can see the kind of dark stains from things. Especially the whisper key on this instrument uh, is just a little too short for the space that it's been allotted between the posts. Um, and that means it rattles a lot, so it gets a fair amount of grease to try to silence that, and then of course it works through it eventually, and then it's loud again. Um, I think they're it would be possible to solve this with very thin washers, um, but I'd want plastic washers because then they'd be wearing away as opposed to like the post or the screw itself, which is important not to wear away. Um, I believe a standard way of getting rid of this much play in an instrument would be um, if you've got your, like this screw kind of going through here, uh, backing the screw out and then sanding down this side, the side that faces the screw head, so that when you screw it back in, the thread goes in a little farther, and this point that comes out, uh, it's easiest, uh, it's not gonna be best. Where is it? This one, right here. Um, the, the little point of the screw that comes out to this side that would normally go into the, the rod of the instrument, or rod of the key, um, that it goes in just a little bit farther. I've heard that that is a way to do it. The problem is, is that that also takes off any of the plating on the outside face of the thing, so like, I'll have that done when I'm gonna have the instrument replated, thanks. <laughs> Not something I wanna do on my own. Well, it looks fine. Best I can tell. Oh, uh, hmm. Maybe it could use a run through of the uh, swab. look like a yeah okay it definitely looks better there was like a little build up so even though I played barely at all apparently that's enough I should have swabbed out more thoroughly anyway on to silver polishing the more satisfying side of the polishing and 
again, it's like, it's such a big difference. Like you got the, the tip of this. That doesn't do a lot. Like one swipe doesn't do a lot, I guess. But like, that is pretty substantially different than it was. And it's just, it takes seconds. It's the magic of chemistry, I guess. Dark. Light. Just, just the tarnish coming off. The metal itself was that bright. Definitely looks shiny. There's a little, a little still shining or <laughs> shining through, a little still kind of clouding the shine under it. So I'm not exactly sure what what's doing that. It looks like it's got some texture. Maybe there's some pitting or something that the cloth is not getting into, which is probably another vote for replating. But that is not where I'm at financially at the moment. Plus, I'm not sure what the downtime for replating looks like. Because it could probably be done in like a, a week's time or less. But I don't want to just like abandon the instrument. You know, if I've got something scheduled, like if I'm going on a long trip or something, sure. But when I could otherwise be playing, eh, harder sell. Let's get under the spring. Do a little polishing there. Probably not a problem, but not something you want to do. Almost completely used up this side. Other side looks okay. Do some flossing in between the gaps. It's sort of visible. I'm not a hundred percent sure I like the camera setup, but it mostly does the job. Maybe part of it's just kind of being used to like where to hold something up to show it. Pretty good. Mm. Aside from removing all the hardware from an instrument, I'm kind of curious what this would be done with in a professional shop. Whether it would be like a like a buffing wheel with uh, the right polishing compound on it, because that would be fast. But I would imagine you'd run into the same issues of like getting into the gaps that I'm running into. So would it just be done by hand like this? 
It doesn't feel like it's the most efficient option. Alright. Still a bunch more posts to go, but it's definitely more than half, like two thirds now. Do this one. I did that side, going on this side. You end up doing this on your own. It is a great time to just like put on something and watch. Because while you have to like kind of pay attention to what you're doing, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't watch something subtitled if you were doing this. Because you do have to like look at it a fair amount. But just having something go in the background, it's just kind of like continuous, you know, mild labor. Shine up the tone holes just a bit. I'll do the same with a little protector at the bottom of the tenon. That looks reasonable. Maybe there's still a little bit of polishing to do though. This one is being kind of stubborn. It's hard to get all the way under it though. That wasn't even a spring. I just like pushed the end of a screw into my finger. That's not helpful. Is this shiny enough at the top? Uh, a little bit more. Just a little. I think this is pitting or something. Because it's not really coming out well. But that'll do. So. We've got another pass to do to get Graham off the finish. Then clean out the tone holes. Go over a thing with the paintbrush. And then I believe it is time to oil the bore. I've been going for like about two hours. So I might take a little, little break there just for a moment. Got all sorts of like little finish cracks in this area. You can see. Oh, that's a little low. Oh no, that was actually there. It's just hard to see. The light is always weird for some reason. Lighting is hard. The 
other side. Okay, that is the finish. That looks pretty good. So I'll clean up tunnels. And there's stopping going on. Hopefully not too much. Okay, get this up here. These are the ones that are gonna need it the most. Apologize for the percussion. <laughs> Ooh, there is some grime in there. Okay, so it's very good that I'm doing this because I do see some some little part particles coming out, and that's that's the point. When I get that stuff moving. Don't want it to build up for too long, or it will cause problems with the sound and the articulation and whatnot. I have to be especially careful doing this one, because I believe this one has... yeah. So I, I actually probably won't do this one with this brush, because that one has been... Uh, what's it called? Shinned? Is that a good word for it? I put in a little piece of plastic to effectively make the bore a little bit smaller there. Um, so I think I need a smaller brush. I don't think they're in this box. Yeah, I, th I think I know where these are. Let's see. to try. Hmm. I know I have little tiny brushes somewhere. Not exactly sure where. I'd like to get into the the flick key, flick key tone holes. Um, but I guess I, I said I was going to take a break, real soon. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go take a break, see if I can find these things, and then I'll be back in just a couple minutes. All right. So I did not find the brush that I was looking for. So I believe I'm just going to improvise. Not for very many tone holes. I don't need to do like super extensive cleaning, I think. So just needed something to kind of poke some of the grime out. And what I came up with? Toothpick. They're made of a soft wood that as long as I'm not applying much pressure, shouldn't be doing any damage to things, especially on these like metal walled ones. And I'm just going to run it around the inside with the idea that if there's any kind of buildup of like grime on the inside of these holes, which these little tiny holes are of the most sus susceptible to, um, that it'll kind of knock it free and get it out of the way a little bit. And normally I'd use, uh, I've got these little tiny like uh, plastic brushes for actually cleaning out like airbrush nozzles and that kind of thing. Um, so they go down to very small sizes. I'm actually like, 
this is something that's worth mentioning. Um, when you're doing this kind of thing, when you're just kind of knocking something, trying to knock something free, and this goes for when you're doing this on reeds, like when you're like sanding the inside of a reed to try to take out some like little fibers or something. Um, the feel of what, what it feels like when you're pushing in should count for a lot, and it feels like this is catching on something, and that's usually a bad sign. But it does, it does let me go all the way into the bore and kind of spin freely, which is not bad for that side. Is this one smaller? Okay, this, this might be better sized for this hole. Yeah, okay, that doesn't look too bad. But like I was seeing a little bit of grime on the toothpick itself, which suggested there was something in there built up on the side, even if it wasn't much. Um, and then I was just like, the feel of the side of the hole was rough, which you'd assume would be normally that kind of build up. I think maybe, I don't know, something, something with a liner or something with the seam with, you know, the metal and the wood and the liner and that kind of thing altogether, uh, just was a little, little, little out of whack. <laughs> and I was just feeling that kind of under the toothpick. Yeah, there, there is a little bit of grime in these, so this is... This is good to be doing. Um, not an amount that would like have prevented them from working as flick keys or anything. Um, not anything that severe, but like an amount that is like the start of the buildup where that could happen. Um, so just having checked on this, you know, this year, this time, I think is particularly valuable. And does this? Oh, okay. So this one also had a little plastic insert, and I started taking it out by using the toothpicks. So I will be gentle, and I won't run the brush through, and I will make sure that I didn't push it into the bore. Did I push something into the bore, though? Not from this side. So, I am seeing something in the bore, which I think I'm just going to blow out. I wonder if I did knock out a little plasty thing. Um, I didn't actually put one in myself to those tone holes, so maybe this was pre-done. And if it is, well, I know which one I counted the resistance on, so I can I can fix that and put it back in. So let's get it out. Well, I don't see it. Uh, that could have also meant that it's just a bunch of grime. Because it, it, it didn't look like obviously like a clear thing in the bore. It could have just been a little bit of something that came off in like a little flake. It's definitely not there now. Does this feel any different than it did? No, it doesn't. And there was this one which never felt particularly bad. I'll go add this down just to make sure I'm not missing anything. And if I see a suspect piece of plastic later, I'll know where it came from. But I would think normally these tone holes are so small that that kind of shim wouldn't be used. Um, so I assume that it was just a little bit of grime that I saw and it's out now. Good, and the cleaning is successful. All right, so if that's the end of that, I need to brush it down with the, what's it called? This one, paintbrush, that's the word. Man, that took a while. Just to make sure that the dust is gone, is out. Whatever I can get before I put on the polish, or oil, I guess. It acts as a polish mostly on this joint. <laughs> get under things, get around things, get in little crevices that the claws couldn't quite get to. Looks pretty good. All right. So then I believe that should be oiling now. 
Um, it's, it doesn't matter maybe as much, given that uh, it's going to be so long until I, like, it's going to be almost 24 hours before I do the, the next step and put it back together. Um, but I like the idea of giving it longer than, you know, longer than it needs. So I think that will be it. Now the question for today is how to apply it inside the Borg. Because I didn't have a great solution the last time I did this. Basically when you're, when you're running the bore oil down the long joint, um, you need something long enough to get it all the way through. <laughs> and that is kind of tricky to just have around the house unless you have like dowels or something spare. And actually for the long joint I think I probably do have something. So maybe, mm, uh, but it's a piece of cherry. So I think the only thing that's dowel-like that I have that's long enough to get all the way through is a strip of cherry wood that I cut off for, actually, for making the, uh, the harpsichord that's behind me that is not in shot now. Um, or refurbishing it. I didn't really make it all the way. Um, but I was thinking, what if I applied oil to the cloth and then ran it through a couple times? And it, it seems like it's not... It's not quite as large as you'd want for like a proper application on this thing, on this like joint specifically, um, but it'll probably work. And I could even do like uh, the the good old paper towel version in the end, in the in the more open end, and then use the cloth for the end of it. So I I will do maybe the other joints first, and then I'll kind of come back to this and see. It'll work for this one though is important. Yeah, maybe I'll just do it for all of them. I think it's going to be messier application than usual, and of course I'll need to, to clean this pretty substantially before I actually use it to swap my instrument again. Um, but I think that's fine. So I will do the interior of the bores first. Uh, when you're oiling your bore, you don't need to do the line bores at all, so you don't need to do the wing joint inside at all, and you don't need to do the line side, the smaller side of the boot at all. It'll just be the bell, the long joint, and the bigger side of the, uh, whatever that's called, that I just talked about. My brain is not working today, apparently. Boot. <laughs> um, and I will figure out a way to get this kind of oiled up and hopefully not too messy with uh, the whole thing. Let's see. Let's see if I can manage that. So the idea is that you want to apply it to the side and kind of let it soak through because you really don't want a huge amount of oil on the cloth. You're not trying to go for a heavy application. Um, the heavy application will just mean you have to clean up more afterwards to get it to be dry enough the next day that you can like put the pads back on, put the keywork back on, which the pads are the concerns for. Um, so I don't need like a huge amount, but I also don't know how much like really soaks into this cloth. I haven't used this before for this task. And then I do want some on this leading edge. All right, well this will be the loosest one that this goes into, because this is the widest bore. Um, but I'll drop it through, and I'll see if I see any difference in the shine of it. Because if I can see shininess on the inside of the bore, I know oil has been applied to it. Not really like that. Uh, but this is so loose, it's not really applying pressure on its own. So let's do more of like this. See if that did anything. Only a little, okay. So I think I do want a little more oil on this. I'm going to have to put it in the sink when I'm done or something. This is a messy stage to do this, like a messy part of the cleaning thing to do. I guess all of it is a little bit because you're, you know, taking grease off or you're taking tarnish off, which can get on your hands or you're oiling things up. Um, but this one is, it seems particularly potentially messy. But the idea is that you want a thin coat of oil on the inside of the board. On the inside of the board that is wood. 
it is absolutely fine if something gets on the outside because I'm going to be applying it there in a second anyway. This is all new direction of application. I usually will put a small amount of oil on a paper towel and then drive it through as lightly as possible. That works. Um, with the uh, dowel. That's the word. What today? Doing something a little different. This one actually could work this way still. Like maybe I should have on this side. I do have some chopsticks in here for this purpose. They're just not long enough to be the, the full dowel. Drive it in from this end. And if you're driving stuff through, you want to be gentle. You want to be using something that uh, when you push on it, it's not it's not something that can that can damage the wood. Um, so something that is wood or softer, you know, a certain kind of soft plastic would work. You probably don't want to use hard plastic. You don't want to use metal for sure. Um, and then you want to drive it through from the small end to the big end so that it's tightest right at the beginning and that as you go down the bore, if something feels like it's starting to get stuck, it unsticks itself because the bore's getting bigger. Something you, you do want to be careful with. And it looks like I could use some more oil on this. This is more absorbent than I thought. So, back from the narrower side. It's a little stuck on something at the moment, so I'll make it a little narrower. Remember, it doesn't have to exert much pressure on the outside of the bore to apply oil to it, so it's not actually critical that you get like a tight fit. In fact, it's better not to because then you have less of a risk of causing problems, getting your swab or whatever cloth you're using stuck inside. Yeah, it's looking better. It's still not like fully applied, so since I'm going to be using one like, I'll be using this on the other joint, for sure. Um, but since I'm going to be using a paper towel on the outside of the instrument anyway, I need to have an oiled paper towel with me, and I'll just use that and drive it through in my standard way. Which is basically the same as what I just did. This just seems to do a better job with coating. And it is important when you're doing applying the oil to the cloth like this, that you actually seal the end, because if you leave a little gap, the oil will just spew out. It's uh, less than ideal. This is probably too little, but that's fine. So let's do this. It's big. And if you're, if you're using paper towels and you're pushing too hard to get it through, uh, it will also just rip the paper towels while you're pushing on it. So that's another reason not to to overdo the tightness of the thing you're driving in. You can also kind of roll it up a little like I just did to get it in. Because that tends to exert pretty reasonable pressure. And then, because we're not having a lot of oil on the, the cloth itself, it's normal for it to be kind of unevenly applied in the bore. So you can just run it through again. Yeah, and that looks good. Basically, all the inside looks slightly shiny. I can still see like areas where it looks like very little oil was applied, but it's a relatively even coat. I do this every year, so I'm not I'm not worried about an application being you know a little less than full. So I'm gonna try this one again. We apply a little bit more still because it doesn't feel as wet as the paper towel does, and then run it through the long joint which is the one that I need this, this specifically for because I don't have a long enough you know, dowel to push through otherwise. Oh, got a little leak. Doesn't look like it actually got there. And I'll go from the narrow side to the wider side. Let's see if this does anything. Ooh, it's not a lot. Okay. Um, I 
little bit of improvisation, I think. I know I have a slightly longer plastic rod. I don't think I want to use that piece of cherry, like I said. You could potentially just use more paper towels. Like this is not, as long as you're being safe about not getting it stuck in the bore, like this is not a particularly like critical thing, you know, you can just kind of give it a shot. And actually this might work well because the fit is very loose and I can push it down farther and then because the bore opens up, oh, not quite. I was hoping the weight of the chopstick would just kind of pull it through. Mm -hmm. Let's try from here. There we go. It's the right idea. That's the kind of amount of pressure you want your um, paper towel to be like exerting on the outside of it. Really not that much. Just enough to apply some oil and then get on. So I will put a little more oil on it and I'll do that again. And this is kind of rolling it up like this. So that it expands some on its own but so that it's not really like packed together in any way. And the most oil will be applied at the end, both because that's like where you're sticking it in where the oil is kind of most on it, and because you're putting it in from uh, the narrowest side, so that's also where it's being squeezed the tightest. Looks like I've gotten a, close to half of it doing this, and just the little bit of it I've done has done like a pretty good job. So I'm gonna see if I can get the other side, just kind of from this end. See if I can get enough coverage just from jamming it in. It doesn't look so bad. Because I know that this fits very loosely, I'm going to go the other direction. Because what I want is a little bit of the oil to be applied kind of to the middle of the bore. So where it starts constricting on it is where I want the oil to be. Yeah, it's still a little loose for that though. Alright. It does look better though. I can see some like streaks down through the middle that I didn't see before. I'm improvising, but it's not complicated, as long as you kind of know what to look for for seeing it applied. So that definitely helped on that side, so I'm going to rotate it a little bit and see if I can get gravity to help me out and get the other side. Just wipe the literally oily rag across the instrument. And that, that actually looks quite good. There's a little area that doesn't have a lot of a lot applied, but that's probably best. You don't want this to be a heavy coat. It doesn't need to be. There's no like functional reason for it to be a heavy coat. Uh, so I will do the unlined side of this, starting again with the narrower side. And this should be more straightforward because it'll be a tighter fit with the, what it was called, claw. There it is. Ooh, it's not a particularly tight fit though. Though I think it's done the job. Yeah, that actually looks quite shiny. I think that's done well. Do just a little bit in here. And now this cloth, this oily cloth, was basically done for. So I'm gonna go put it somewhere where it doesn't keep making a mess. Be back in just a second. Okay, 
now that the inside of the bore is done, we do the outside. And this is much easier. You just have to be careful for the uh, springs. <laughs> it's not good to get caught in the springs at any point in the, in the service. And when you apply it, there's nothing. I usually avoid getting it on the, the corks at the end. I try to get this little bit of, uh, what's it called, this wood right at the base of it. But it's not that critical. Um, because the tone holes are like open wood that is unfinished would be uh, like the lacquer on the outside. I like to do a little bit of an extra of like, you know, a touch, touch each of those as well just to get it to kind of soak in. Um, I don't know how critical that is, probably not very. Um, and it is important actually before you reassemble the whole thing to make sure there's not any built up oil on those. So if your cloth has like a lot of oil on it, it's easy to put a little bit too much in that area and you'll just have to wipe it up before you reassemble it anyway. But that, I don't know if that's apparent. Maybe that's apparent from the lighting on, on the, like the bottom part of this. That looks to me like pretty substantially shinier than it was before. And that's basically the goal. Because a small amount of this oil should actually get through like cracks and pores in the finish, if there are any, depending on the finish you've got. Um, and then some of it will get around, you know, the tone hole area where it's been applied. Some of it will get around the other holes that are cut in it or in, or around the base of the, uh, whatever they're called, words, base of the, uh, starts with a P. <laughs> These things that are all over the instrument. Uh, not pivot screws. Do they start with a P? I'm confused now. But it gets gets along all the little cracks and crevices that you could find on the instrument. Posts. That's the word. And with these big tone holes in the boot, because they are they're cut a ways through the wood, it's not really a bad thing to like roll up an end of the cloth and stick it in the tone hole a little bit. Because getting it applied to the, the wood of the tone hole is probably helpful overall. Like I'm applying it to all the wood otherwise, so it seems like that one would make sense to also apply it to. I don't think it's necessarily required. It's not something I usually go out of my way to do. But it's something you can do. It feels thorough to do it. And I think generally the, the oil somewhat regularly applied, probably not at the pace that I do, but having some oil applied to it occasionally is good for just keeping it from shrinking and expanding as much as it normally would. Uh, if it was untreated, I mean. Because it's going to do that anyway with the humidity. But if you can get in there and give it a coat of something that, that soaks in as a little bit of a moisture barrier. It's a little bit of a just way to kind of fill out the, the wood of the instrument. I think that's going to be good for overall long-term stability. Yeah, that looks fine. One more to do. Yeah, it's, it does, I think this does look shinier than this one. I think that's true. But it's like, when, especially after, after the oil has kind of soaked in and you've brushed off the excess, um, it's surprisingly different looking than like the normal instrument. And I think it's like, when I first got this instrument, they had like a, like a waxy kind of finish and they may have well used a wax to do it. Um, but, I get the same kind of finish from oiling it like this. Like, whatever residual remains kind of part of the finish when you wipe most of it away. Um, seems to give it that, like, glossy, little bit waxy texture. It certainly feels like fresh and new and clean when it's done like that. Whether it's actually useful, uh, it's harder to say. 
So I'm going to apply a little bit just to the ends that are kind of facing out, that are not like mating with the tenons. I have to be careful picking them up because they are greasy now. But just a little bit of oil to everything, and that's basically it for oiling. Oiling at the bore, I mean. So I'm going to go get rid of this and wash my hands thoroughly. Because I've got less oily things to do. So, the bore has been oiled, the, the step that is critical to do before the next day when you want to put it back together is done. Um, the, the extra you can do today is basically bonus, um, but I'm, I'm thinking it's better to do it now than it is to do it then. So I can just start by re reassembling things basically next time. Uh, so if I can manage to actually get through all of this polishing, that's what will happen. So basic idea is the same as what I was doing on the body of the instrument like an hour ago where you clean it so that you get the grime off of the like the ends and then you polish it. And this pad looks a little hard. This might actually be worth replacing this time around. Uh, I don't remember if I have one of the right size. If I don't I'll just put it back on as is and then uh, replace it when I order one. Since it's not critical, it's been sealing okay so far. But yeah, this, this part is the most time consuming, I think. And yeah, it's just more cleaning. I'm trying to apply a decent amount of pressure with the, the cloth because it seems to take off a little faster if you do but I don't want to mess with the, the pad even though I might replace this one um, and I don't want to get this gray part of the cloth on the pad in particular because that will just tarn transfer some of the tarnish that is on the cloth to the pad and make it look like sooty so rather than do that I try to be careful of that area Easier said than done, but you know, you make an effort.
<sighs> Riveting content, I'm sure. This first key is almost done. <laughs> and there are keys that are easier to do than others. And there are keys that, for whatever reason, even though they're all exposed to basically the same air, um, there are keys that have a significant amount less tarnish than this on them. And I've never really been totally able to explain it. Like, it might be that the tarnishing is, like, accelerated by, you know, touching or handling or something, and it's, like, the ones that get handled and then exposed to the air are, like, gonna tarnish faster than the ones that are just exposed to the air. I don't really know. Actually, what time is it? So I've been going for close to three hours. Maybe content-wise, it would make more sense to do some of this off-stream. Because this is the last thing that I'm doing today. It's just cleaning keys. And there's maybe some, some remarks to be made about individual keys or spots. Um, but the, like the, the setup for it is going to be the same for all of it. So I might just do like a handful more keys and then just put in, put in a cut, go do it offline, just watching TV or something. You can do stuff like this. So if you've got a long rod, you can like kind of choke up on the end here with the cloth and spin it around. And then you kind of are like buffing it out a little bit. Doesn't quite get everything, but it's not bad for it. And get everything nice and shiny. And again, to keep keep the tarnish that's already on the cloth away from the pad, keep from kind of getting that all nasty. I just will usually hold the, the pad down on something cloth and then kind of buff the top of it. And then only do, you know, the sides and stuff at the end and then be careful about touching the pad. So at least you're spending a minimal amount of time where like, there's a real risk of going and messing it up, m messing up the look of the pad. It, I don't know if the tarnish actually is going to like negatively affect it, even in the long term. Um, and it will, the soot look, the, the tarnish, um, can certainly be wiped off. It's just more steps. There's enough steps to this thing already. So this side. Um, it's worth mentioning, this is also the time where you inspect your corks and you inspect your felts. Um, because if there's anything in particular that needs attention, like tomorrow when I'm assembling it is going to be when it happens. So far, so good. And most of the time, if your instrument is working, like that's, that's how it's going to be. You're not going to have to replace much. But like there's a little bit of an edge of the cork on this one that is like torn up a little. Um, I don't think this is to the point where it would make noise, but like it's certainly on its way to being a problem. So at some point that one will need to be replaced. It's not hard to replace. You get an appropriately sized and shaped one, which something sometimes requires some shaping to do to get a good one. Um, and then you glue on on with convex cement basically once it's been shaped and sanded or whatever to the right size. When you've got a key like this that has a screw going through it, uh, just make sure you're doing one at a time and just leave that screw out in a prominent place where you're not going to forget it and where it's not going to be knocked on the floor. Um, and you'll, you'll figure it out, you know. If you started polishing like several keys at once, then you could, you could run into risks of uh, like getting the, them confused between each other, getting the screws confused between each other. 
but as long as you're doing it one at a time, the wrist is pretty small. Pretty okay. The nice thing is that on the keys, if there's a spring attached, it's probably not nearly as sharp as the ones on the body of the instrument. So there's much less risk of injuring yourself this way. And at least so far, I've managed not to poke myself with the springs. We'll see if that continues tomorrow. <laughs> Put the screw back in and like at this point the screw has not been re-greased and it's not even like a super clean screw we're gonna have to kind of clean the grease off the end of it before we reuse it anyway um, but that's that's secondary the grease is gonna be it's gonna pick up the least amount of dirt for when you have it on the instrument if you do it right before you put it back um, so it's better to just kind of let them be for now in my opinion um, and then just clean it and grease it and put it on kind of all at once on the other side. And man, I am dropping a lot of frames. I'm glad I'm local recording this. The internet has not been great these last few days. Looks pretty good. How long is this taking me? Um, I don't know, 10 minutes? Something like that? And you can see, maybe you can see, um, that there's, on this key, there's this little felt here, like on the underside of this part. And the front, the nose of it, is just kind of peeling up a little. And the felt seems to be in reasonably good shape. Um, so I think when I reassemble it, I'll just apply a little bit of glue there and get it to be re-glued. It has been doing fine before. If I just put it on without gluing it, it would probably be fine still, at least for a while. Um, but it would be more likely to catch on something. It would be more likely to peel off kind of on its own. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the remaining keys on the long joint. Just in case I run into anything else that I want to say. This is what I just did, maybe out of habit, is something that you can do if you're worried about the like the grease on the screw. You can just wipe the screw off too. Then when you put it back in, it's going to be significantly less that way. But yeah, I'm going to just do the remaining ones on this part of the instrument and then sign off and do the rest uh, on my own. So that I can just reassemble things tomorrow. Because, as I've been saying, it's not the most fascinating work. <laughs> it's important to do it, but it's a little on the mindless side. You know, you don't have to, especially doing it all by hand like this, you don't really have to think of too many things that are a risk or that are like a danger to you or anything like that. Um, it's just kind of a lot of time spent polishing. Which I think is how like a lot of polishing even professionally goes. <laughs> But, yeah. That looks pretty good. 
I think this is the more comfortable spot for me to work, and that's why I keep defaulting to it. I know that it's not the the one that is visible on camera, though, so I shouldn't. Seems okay. If you have keys like this on the instrument that have like a little bit of paper on them, you do have to be careful when polishing around that or else you'll just take the paper off. It's not the end of the world by any means, but it means that you have to do another step. Um, sometimes the thickness of the paper is important. Like it's it's put on there as a, as a shim between these little, uh, what are they called? Uh, like the posts with the section carved out of the inside that you are used for aligning these like flat lengths of on keys. I don't know the technical term for that. Unlike the other ones where I just had been forgiving it consistently. Um, but yeah, they're kind of used as like bushings in that situation where they prevent it from being the sound of metal on metal, but they also make the gap a little narrower so it fits a little tighter and just has less play in it. Um, and depending on why they were installed and how they were installed and you know by who and all that um, they can be it like the thickness of the paper can be important to that uh, so if you can avoid replacing them that's probably the best option just because you know that, that this it's been set to work um, if you have to replace them just any old piece of paper it could be worth trying like as long as it's you know looks reasonable and that kind of thing um, because it's basically just a piece of paper like that, it just the thickness may be a problem. Like they may have used a thicker or thinner piece of paper to fit the gap that was there on the instrument, and if you use too thick or too thin of one, maybe your paper will not fit. <laughs> so it can be difficult to gauge that by eye just when you start. So it can take some trial and error, I can say from experience. This is very much a, a section of work that gets your hands dirty. Wouldn't be good to like scratch your nose here. Unless you wanna you wanna look like you've been working with charcoal all day. pretty good. The paper is still intact. It's nice. It looks like the low D key is good. Got three more. Same procedure. I'll have a good look at all the little bits on it. We'll get some tapping from upstairs. Is that visible? It's sort of visible. It's actually more over here, okay. This is another one, just covering up the pad so that I'm not just rubbing tarnish from the cloth onto the pad continuously. It also gives me something where I can like press down a little bit into 
makes it easier to even in, into crevices and things as well, which is nice. Because there's there's quite a bit of that where like you can polish the top of a keycap or something, and then you look at it and you just have like a little dark line right in the corner where it meets the other parts. <sighs> and to some degree, that's not a bad look. Like I'm not I'm not complaining all the time of that, but. I think usually you want to be like pretty small <laughs> if that's the case. It's not always conducive to that unless you're applying some pressure. Frames are still going crazy. Jeez. Yeah, I'm very glad I'm local recording this. I haven't stopped yet. <laughs> I'm not out of disk space. This is at least close. You do have to be a little careful with this kind of spring, um, with these like leaf spring things. Um, they're usually held on by a screw, and that little screw is driven, you know, into the metal, and tapped into it, uh, presumably. Uh, but it's a very small screw, and the metal that it's going into, not so much the screw itself, but the metal that it's attaching to, is somewhat soft metal. Uh, so it's not super hard to strip that screw out, especially if you're having to, like, take it out and put it back in, that kind of thing. So it's worth being a little, you know, a little careful about it. And if you ever do have to torque those screws down, uh, be gentle with the amount of push you apply because they probably don't take a lot extra than what is required to take to you know make them tight before they start stripping I will just give a little that a little more polish to that one this is the low C key and we got low B and low B flat together. Get the pin out from between them. Get the keys apart. Grease off. And it's not really a problem to leave them ungreased for a day as you're doing this. Everything will be greased systematically as I put it back on, so I'm not worried about like forgetting it or anything and not having grease on a key. It doesn't really happen, or it hasn't really happened. And this is another felt that I think I've actually re-glued already. Because it looks like it's peeling slightly, but has kind of like been prevented from peeling. <laughs> and when you're doing this kind of thing on a regular basis, when you're taking like a close look at all of your keys from the underside, uh, you will run into things like that. And if you want to fix them, if it's an opportune moment, you can. And it's not that hard. The keys are already off. You don't have to do anything extra that way. So this is a really nice way to like keep after like potential maintenance. So that way, if it comes a moment where, you know, the thing you're worried at breaks, the, the felt comes off and it starts clacking up a storm or something like that, um, you can be relatively sure that's not just going to happen on its own because you've been paying attention to this stuff as it's been going on. Oh yeah, that, that felt is coming off. And that, I wonder if that one's been re-glued. It's got a, like a little strap of paper around it. 
you can see at all there. There's the felt on the bottom. Is that out of focus? It's hard to see from this. Um, but there's the felt on the bottom of the of the uh, key body, I guess you could say. Um, it's not a rod because it's square. Maybe they call it a square rod. I'm not sure. The felt on the bottom there is peeled off on one side of the the white paper and is glued down on the other. So the paper itself is just, you know, the only thing that's kind of holding it on. And that means I will definitely want to re-glue or replace the uh, felt. I think the argument against replacing it entirely would just be that I'd also have to replace the paper because there's no way I'm getting that felt off without tearing the paper. Because it's, it's literally just strapped on the whole thing. So that will probably just be a re-glue. And maybe that won't last as long, but it'll probably last until the next time, and then when the paper starts showing wear, you know, then it can all be re-replaced more formally. Looks pretty good. Maybe this can be a demonstration of the, the shininess of a polished one. These two were side by side and looked identical when I started. It's just, it's just like, it's almost a different metal. One last one. getting under the spring a little bit, but without pushing it to the side too much. Again, because I don't want to mess with that screw more than I have to. Looking better. Going up to the next piece of paper and trying not to mess with the paper itself too much. There's, there's some darkness on here. Did I just take off the paper? No. I don't think so. There's a, there's a side of the paper on this one that is missing. I think this might have been replaced. This might actually have been, been the one that prompted the story about paper thickness. Um, because only one side, actually, it, it only goes up actually on one side. And it might have been that the replacement paper was too thick. So I ended up having to do it only on one side for it to fit in the little gap that was available. Not ideal, because then you don't have the kind of metal-on-metal metal silencing on both sides. Uh, but a tight enough fit otherwise that it wasn't a problem. Like, a, this is not a noisy key for me.
close to death. think I called that set. The felt on this one looks okay, even though the felt on the other will need re-gluing. Without any grease in place, get these back together, get the screw in so that it's all organized and kept tidy and all that. Put it up next to the long joint in the right place. And that is a small number of keys on the instrument. Um, I'm expecting probably another hour or two worth of this kind of polishing, um, and I'm not sure there's much to add to it. So, I'm going to call the stream here. <laughs> uh, if you're still watching, I do appreciate it. Um, I will be back again tomorrow at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern to put everything back together. I will have done the other like key polishing and cleaning that is necessary before then, because I think that's just not, not worth capturing on video. <laughs> it's not that interesting. Uh, but I'll be replacing the keys, I'll be regluing those felts and things. Uh, I might swap a pad or something. Um, and then, at the very end, give it, give it a, give it a play test. I, I guess, before I go, um, now that it's been like half an hour or so since I, I put on the bore oil, this is a good time to give the outside of the instrument just kind of a, a rub down with a dry cloth. Um, this can be a regular cloth, I'm, you know, I'll probably use a regular cloth. I've been oil soaking other things, so it's not a problem. Um, but the idea is that you're just trying to get excess uh, oil off the outside of the instrument. Um, it's kind of hard to handle when it's like this, and there are parts of the instrument, like the shiny, uncracked parts of the finish and the metalwork and that kind of thing, where it's just never going to get through if it's on there, so it's worth cleaning that up. It's worth paying special attention when you're wiping the outside off to the um, tone holes the wood line tone holes in particular, because it's easy for uh, the oil to have pooled a little bit, unlike the, the seams of that. Um, and if the oil is still there when you put the pads on, it gets into the pads and that can make them sticky, that can ruin the pads, doesn't do good things. So tonight, uh, actually probably right after I shut this off, I'll go through and just, just wipe down the whole thing with a dry cloth, paying special attention to get any extra oil around the tone holes. And then before it's assembled, so the first thing to do when I come back for this um, tomorrow, I'll do it again. Because right now it's just about getting the excess up, and then tomorrow will be the kind of final check for that thing. Um, but yeah, like I said, done for now. I'll do the polishing on my own time. I'll come back at 5 tomorrow, and we'll put this thing back together and make sure that it still plays. <laughs> and then after that, I'll, I'll be back to playing as I normally would. So, for the, the end of this this maintenance video, the first half or so, more than half, I'd say, is done. Thanks for watching.